the, for our next session, the public sector speaks certification and compliance in the cloud age. It's a great conversation. We're going to have Chris Wallace, John Z Zanni, Keith Lukes, and Brian Grayick. And they're going to talk to you all about it. I'm going to hand this right over to John. John, take it away. Okay, great. Thank you for coming. Uh, we will have a great hour here talking. It is a small group, so if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. The very good looking guy over there will hand you a mic so we can all hear uh, the questions. Before I jump in with questions and talk about this topic, I'll ask each of you to just do a quick introduction of who you are, what you do, and why they should care. Fair. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Wallace. I'm a senior security engineer at F1 Computer Solutions. It's a small little MSP in Manassas, Virginia, about 30 miles outside of DC. Um, I do the paperwork stuff, regulatory compliance, NIST, cybersecurity framework, CMMC eventually, et cetera, et cetera. Um, quick shout out to the cute redhead right there. It is our one year wedding anniversary. <laughs> oh. And thank you. She's also my boss in real life too, it's weird. Uh, that's, that's for another time though. But she was kind enough to let us come here so that I could be with you all, so thank you. I'm Keith Lukes, I'm the director of Channel Solutions at Ubistore. Um, we provide backup and DR as a service. Um, we work through um, channel partners and big resellers like CDW and Connection and their CDW, G and, and government and uh, vertical. Um, so I do a lot of the pre-sales solution architecture and design. Um, a lot of the, the sales component and, and education of those sales teams on um, backing up and protecting um, data and infrastructure for um, those uh, specific customers. So look forward to talking with everybody today. Brian Grank, I'm the uh, virtual CISO for Cosant Security uh, out of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I've been in security for 40 years. I, I know I'm, I look a little you know, younger than that, but uh, <laughs> that's the good part. Uh, security, I guess, hasn't aged me that much. But um, I've been doing it for a long time, uh, ever since college. Um, I've worked for three of the Fortune 100 companies. I've been a CTO. I've been a vice president of the seventh largest software company. And um, I guess the reason you should probably listen to me is when the uh, Obamacare site, the healthcare.gov site was hacked, I was the one that uh, they brought in in order to make it so it wasn't hacked again. So that was uh, a few years ago. But it just tells you uh, I've got a, a little bit of expertise in the area. Uh, I'm a virtual CISO for about um, eight companies now, and what I do is I spread my time around those eight companies, and then I also do uh, compliance and uh, help people to get more secure in the real life. Well, thank you. And for those of you who might not know me, I'm the CEO of Acronis SCS. We're an independent U.S. subsidiary of Acronis focused on public sector and most specifically certified services. Uh, for the U.S. public sector. So my team is all U.S. citizens, our support is U.S. based, and I live in the certification and compliance world. Prior to that, I was at Microsoft for a long time, worked with a lot of MSPs, I ran the SPA channel. Uh, that's really my expertise. I've been drinking from the fire hose <laughs> when it comes to certifications and compliance. And, um, and some of it's a little scary as my voice uh, changed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I'll, I'll give you, I, I mean, no, I'll give you... a scary voice. Yeah, <laughs> that was, scary that voice. was my uh, scary voice. Well, so, <laughs> I'll give you an example. How many of you have heard of CMMC? Phew. Yep. Uh, the uh, Cybersecurity Maturity Model Framework uh, that's been developed by the U.S. government, which will trickle down to everybody and everything eventually. Uh, that will be a requirement to do business with the DOD to start with, mm -hmm. but I'm already hearing like the state of New York and other states are requiring a certain level. Uh, up through level five, it's 171 controls over 17 domains. Now four and five is top secret and secret. Most of us will only care about three and below, but still fairly significant. And so the question is, um, uh, we are going to have to be, or our customers are going to have to be able to maintain those uh, standards and us for that matter. So I'll start with this question for uh, our panelists here. How is uh, the need for compliance and compliance services or compliance services evolving over the next uh, 12 to 18 months? And because you're right next to me, uh, Chris. I get the prize? You get the prize. <laughs> That's how this works? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's going to go up. I mean, obviously, it's, 
there are 300,000 federal contractors who are going to have to comply with some level of CMMC by October 2025. And while the majority of them, well, all of them, should have already had CMMC level three in place because of NIST 800-171, right. um, they don't. And, and we still get frantic calls. You know, NIST 800-171 is 110 controls for uh, protecting controlled and classified information on non-federal systems, right? As of December 31st, 2017, that was supposed to be done. Like all federal contractors were supposed to abide by that period the end. We got calls as of two months ago from people who were saying, I don't know what CMMC is, I don't know what NIST 800-171 is. So there's, there's a lot of room to educate and, and help people out there, and it's only gonna get wider. That whole channel is only going to get wider. Keith, what, what are you seeing? Other compliance requirements? Yeah, uh, and we also see like a lot of uh, customers are, especially like the subcontractors for the government, coming with like ITAR requirements as yeah. well too. So now they have these um, their own data that they have to protect that when they work with these entities that, and they tend to be small businesses, and some of them are mom and pop shops that have no idea how to handle that. So they're being forced into compliance and 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 being required to follow these structures that they just don't have the, the comprehension about. So they're really looking for um, specific needs around that. So to be able to provide that in a cost-effective and easy way is really what, what we see them looking for. Are you getting more of those questions? Definitely more. Um, and, and I think it it's also talks to the, the customers that we, we work with. I think they're becoming more educated. And, I, I, and to your point, they're expanding that net, right? There are more compliance and, and more um, restrictions being applied to these different entities. So they're being educated on it and being aware that they have to um, do that. And as they, some of these smaller businesses too are um, getting excited about these government contracts and they've won new business and they're now working with these federal agencies for the first time and now they don't understand all the, the requirements that come with that as a business. So I think that's where we're seeing them come to us um, looking for ways to facilitate that. And Chris, you're, you're more on the customer side as a VCISO. Uh, what are you seeing? How do you keep up with all the different acronyms and numbers that come along your desk? Well, there's actually two big problems. One is that um, we're getting a lot of companies coming to us and saying, I'm, I'm getting this letter, or I've got this letter, um, from one of the major DOD companies, you know, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, whatever, and it says a date, like, two weeks or 10 days from now, and it says, we need to have you answer all these questions and say yes to each one of them. And oh, by the way, if you answer any of them incorrectly or falsely, um, $10,000 for each question, five years in jail, for each question you answer incorrectly. And that's gonna scare you. But then the questions are, are you DFARS compliant? Are you FARS compliant? Have you gone through all 110 controls of, of CMMC, you know, 800-171, da 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 all the way down to the end? And our customer says, no, we can't answer yes to all these. What do we do? Well, it says here at the end, if you can't, you will get no more contracts as of this date. Now, they're purposely doing this. They're giving you a two-week or a 10-day period because they're weeding out those 300,000. You remember that Chris talked about? Okay, you've got 300,000 companies out there that have rotten security. If you're, looking, if you're the, the governing body for this, which is called CMMC-AB, advisory board, and you're trying to weed some companies out, how are you gonna do it? Great idea. Let's send a, a little questionnaire, just like Chris said, which is very accurate, is they're already supposed to have been certified by years, years ago, you should have already been answering all this stuff. So how are we gonna weed this 300,000 number down? We're gonna do it by sending them out a letter of cease and desist. You can't answer these questions, you got 10 days, two weeks, there's no way. If you're not already compliant, there's no way they think that you can be compliant with these in 10 days to two weeks. Well, we know better. We've helped two clients so far that were very close to being able to answer those, to be able to say yes, 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 yes across the board and be able to then continue their contracts. Now the problem is we've had a lot more customers that said no and every one of them gets that letter saying no more contracts. Now one of them, just give you just one story. Three person company, $28 million a year, stopped. Wow. That's it, they're done, they're out of business. No more contracts. And having a, a, a 
advisor, someone trusted, is, is super important. It would be like going to court without an attorney. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. I, I could tell you a, a little story. The first time I met Kitty Arrington, who at the time was the CISO for the Department of Acquisition, uh, we sit down in the meeting, you know, she introduces herself and she says, before we start, I have to let you know that we're the federal government. If you lie to us, that's considered a felony and you go to jail. Mm -hmm. Now, I, like, I'm a marketing guy who sells tech, right? I, <laughs> I call it selling the future. Now, all of a sudden, I'm told, wait a second, if the future doesn't happen, I, I you know, I get, I get to go to jail. It's like, okay, this is a different kind of business. Uh, and that's really what I learned, really, to surround yourself with people that have the expertise, that know what needs to be done to make sure that you speak their language. And, I mean, low probability I go to jail, uh, but at the same time... Non-zero uh, is not good. Yeah, <laughs> not, right. And there are fines, and, and you can't fight them. I mean, they have more money than, than we all do. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the next question here is about... Um, how do, how do you advise your customers who are uh, need for certifications or compliance solutions, whether it's government, state, local, or like I was mentioning uh, to someone I was talking to earlier, we actually sell a, uh, we have a product, a non-private product that's on the DOD approved product list for the Department of Defense. We're selling it into manufacturing. And because it turns out that their designs are in air gap ne networks because it's so secret. So, mm -hmm. how, how do you advise your your customers uh, um, uh, on how to architect or plan to meet these rules and regulations? And we'll start with uh, you. So, I think one of the things we found, especially we we do most of our work in the in the K through 12 and in the um, state and local space. Okay. So, I think for us, it it, it comes around um, being able to. Um, sometimes we're even educating them on the capability that they don't even know exists. So I think when, when we talk to them, it's really about um, you know, finding the right mix of technologies that makes sense for their business. Um, and they tend to be very small staffed. And you know, it's usually, especially in state and local, we see it's a lot of, um, on the local side, you know, maybe a one-man band who's trying to do multiple different, you know, balance everything inside of his environment and may not even have awareness of what type of certifications that are available or that they might be required. Um, they may have a PD that does some things that has to have that data protected um, in their environment and may not be aware of everything um, if they're not educated to that level. So if some of it is even being end user educated um, when we talk through them, uh, talk to them about the different services. But those guys are, are usually really, you know, stretched so thin that it's, it's really more about um, just keeping day-to-day -day lights on that they don't have the time or the capability to, you know, to, to keep systems up and running. They don't even have the time to start to really look at some of this stuff. Actually, uh, before I go to the other two panelists, uh, let's drill a little deeper there, because I, I met one of those guys. Uh, besides being the IT guy, he was the warden for the jail. <laughs> uh, awesome. And, and uh, to your point, uh, it was not the top of his list, yeah. right? But how do you, because I also heard we don't have the budget, we don't yep. have a CISO, uh, we, don't, we don't know. Right. How, how have you been able to break that barrier to well, get them to... You know, I think part of the problem is, is that there hasn't been a lot of technology out there to really help them. I mean, that's why we're super interested in, in what you guys are bringing to the table with SES and mm -hmm. that cloud-based capability to be able to protect that with Sieges and FIPS. I mean, you know, whether it's, you know, workstations or, um, you know, we see that for, like, laptops that are running in the field and, you know, in, in officers' cars and on fire trucks, and, and they have requirements around that. So. Um, I think for us, it's it, you know we've done some things where there just hasn't been some of that available, um, where they're running uh, non-compliant because they can come to our data center or it, we can send that to you know Cronus right now to protect it, but we don't have all the compliance check marks that we're now going to be able to bring to the table. Um, so I think for us, when we're looking at you know what SCS is doing, it's going to be educating these field reps and salespeople to actually have these conversations proactively with these. Um, end customers and be like, hey, we've got a really cost-effective service that is compliant, that'll meet your needs as a, you know, as a, as an entity um, that you may not even be aware of or doing. Um, so that's some of the the things we're excited about and what we can bring to the table. Um, because we haven't we haven't spent that much time in the space because 
we couldn't check all the boxes for them when, when they were educated on what they needed and, and, and didn't have it available. It, it, it takes time. Yeah. Like I, I personally went through all 171 controls for CMMC <laughs> to really understand, because all I got was, John, you, we need more money. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good read, isn't it? Yeah. And then I realized that they did. How about you, Brian? How do you advise your uh, the clients you work for in terms of architecting, planning solutions? to meet rules or compliance regulations that they might have? So most of the companies are looking at level three, which is 110 controls. So you're quite a bit less of a subset. The only ones you have to worry about in four and five are those that are dealing with Department of Defense data. So most of the companies are just looking at that level three. And for us, it's, we don't sell, we don't sell a product. So we, we go in there as agnostic to be able to tell them from a you know, completely, completely um, you know, not adhered point of view, we can tell them the kind of things that they should be doing and looking at, what kind of products they should be looking at for those kind of controls to be able to, to be resolved. Um, most of our customers look at us as the, as the advisor that they trust um, as a virtual CISO. I am literally acting as their CISO for the company, so I'm giving them the same kind of information that, you know, if they, if they were to afford a CISO, uh, that that person would give them. And what we do is we go in and we say, you know, each one of these controls, um, how are you doing it? And then if you're not doing it, what do you need to be able to do to be able to resolve that issue? So we're going in there and just going right down the list and figuring out what they can do, what they can't do, and then point them in a direction. Now, with us, it's a little bit different because most of our clients, they're going to be going to an MSSP for a solution. And what we're doing is we're partnering up with MSSPs and MS, um, MSPs and themselves in order to be able to provide those solutions. And what we're finding is that MSPs are the ones that are being the target in the first place, you know, just like SolarWinds attack and such. Yeah. So we're actually now getting more clients and more partners coming to us from the MSSP side than we are by the end user side, which is kind of interesting. Um, we're trying to bring their level up because most of these people have no idea how to provide this kind of level of security services. You know, they can do spam or they can do, um, any malware or they can provide you know some kind of like content filtering or something like that uh, backup and recovery but they can't do it all and that's why Acronis is such a good partner in that it can literally solve most of the technology solutions uh, across the board of the 110. Great so we happen to have an MSP on our panel here or actually two of them but uh, uh, Chris your perspective in terms of uh, how you advise your customers on staying compliant because there's a lot of confusion. We've actually had this discussion. We've had it several times. Where um, they don't even know what they actually need. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's not uncommon. Um, quick backstory, just for context. So back in the day, for classified systems, there, there was the old DIACAP model to get an authorization to operate, right? And the old school train of thought was do nothing for two and a half years for six months, you hire a team to come in and do all the stuff so that you can get your, your authorization to operate. You do, you pop the champagne, you do nothing for two and a half years, and you rinse and repeat forever. And the DIACAP model was replaced six, seven years ago, I think, mm -hmm. by uh, the risk management framework, which I am personally a big fan of because that's really all we're doing at the end of the day is we're trying to understand and mitigate risk. You know. The, the whole likelihood versus impact kind of matrix, and then you go from there. Um, for us as an MSP, trying to understand the risk is different from like a towing company to a, a kidney hypertension specialist to our federal contractor folks, right? So specifically for the compliance stuff, um, I try to reinforce that it is a continuous ongoing process. There are things that we have to do. You know, we're gonna have to test the incident response plan once a year, because we set it right here on page 42 of the incident response plan, you know what I mean? And that could be something as simple as sitting down and having a tabletop little exercise of, hey, you left your laptop at the airport, what do you do? Yeah. You know, just simple stuff like that. Um, or a meteor hit the office, you know? <laughs> but where do we, where's our alternate work site, right. you know? Um, and those kind of engaging things kind of bring them into the process. And I have found that when, when our clients, because we've got several standing meetings um, to go over things like this, but when they feel they have some level of ownership, 
it, it's easier for them to kind of understand and get behind and then you know that then when I go to them and say hey if you want to be CMMC level 5 compliant for whatever reason you're gonna to have to spend this much more money to get a sim solution well what's that well then I explain it you know we already have the rapport and we go from there we get to go to do it but yeah the, the risk management is what I like as an approach okay uh, next topic is about um, sort of the uh, the compliance regulations that are popping to the top in your business. So I'll start with an example. Uh, recently, there's three specific ones that I hear a lot about. One, if we're CMMC compliant, uh, Cronus SES, and then I have to explain there are 300,000, I think, federal contractors in the United States and four auditors. Uh, five so today. No, huh? They got the fifth one today. They did? <laughs> right away. Nice. So that means I'll probably Five get over 300,000, yeah. Yep, it's... so I'll get audited in 2023, 20, 24, something like yep. that, right? And, and so I have to explain to them, one, today as a, a secondary vendor, we're actually not required to be audited. And then second, it's not possible to be audited. Uh, and then explain, then I have to ask them, like, what is it they're really looking for? The other one that really surprised me was CGIS. Mm -hmm. uh, so CGIS is a certification for the court systems. There are 3,000 court systems in the United States, 3,000. All of them have to use hosted services that are CGIS certified. Very few service providers actually, I see some nodding here, are CGIS certified. Uh, we will be. It's a self-certification. Uh, but uh, we're getting more and more of that because it's becoming a requirement. And then the, the third one I bring out that I'm starting to hear, which is not a certification yet, is uh, state ramp. So if you've heard of Fed ramp, yeah. which we're not doing right now, there's a lighter version called state ramp or a proposal of a lighter version called state ramp, which would require any state using a cloud service that the cloud service be state ramp certified. And my answer there is when I see that the controls are published, <laughs> and approved, they won't worry about it. So uh, I, I went overboard. I listed three, but uh, <laughs> while we start with you and work our way down, sure. what are you seeing are the ones you're, you're getting asked about the most? It's definitely CMMC and subsequently NIST 800-171. I mean, we try to stay out of the, the whole medical vertical. A um, little bit of PCI hit or miss, but, but it's definitely more the federal CMMC 800-171. Yeah, we see too a lot of HIPAA um, coming um, because we do a lot of work with um, you know doctors' offices and healthcare, um, and that's a, a big vertical for a lot of our resellers. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen and we've had it come up too where they want all exclusive U.S.-based support. Um, so that's created some challenges, um, and we've seen that some of the like DoD again. Yep. And we're working with those customers that want ITAR compliance, and it's all got to be U.S. based. And so, um, the, the fact that it's not just that component, but it, and, and we were working with a large, um, they're a, a, a outsourced company for uh, healthcare. They have 10,000 doctors that say support, and it came up all it was um, you know U.S. based support. They wanted HIPAA compliance. They wanted BAAs. They wanted all that. Um, so we see that component. Um, around the healthcare side and even some PCI, um, even with some of the data that the uh, you know, state and local is touching where they're talking about having to also be able to check that HIPAA box for some of the data that they have um, within their own um, organization. So those are the kind of things that we're, we're seeing quite a bit. Okay, actually before I go to Brian, I learned at an earlier session today that so there's only 800,000 doctors that uh, are HIP, well need to be HIPAA certified or doctors hospitals, but there's another 500 and 5 million, 200,000 business associates, the term I learned today, which are accountants, lawyers, all those that support yep. those mm -hmm. offices that also need to be HIPAA compliant. Yep. Uh, and if they're not, they're pretty hefty fines, I saw. Yep. Yeah. So that comes up in conversations when we see that. That's where that PCI compliance, we've seen that with some, like you said, some uh, law offices and um, some other different entities that are engaged at that level that are supporting these, you know, much like these subcontractors that work with the, the federal government. It's the same type of scenario. Um, so I think, again, having the, the ability to now proactively go sell with that capability in your back pocket changes that conversation right out of the gate. Um, so that's the, the part we're really excited about, yeah. um, is to be able to, to proactively sort of check all these boxes and say, hey, we're doing this right out of the gate. 
Um, same thing with like talking about, um, we were working with a large um, manufacturer of hard laptops um, and doing some integrations with, with them. And again, they're like, a lot of these are going into, you know, police cars and things like that. So they're like, if you're not Cegis, and this was, you know, we talked to them at the beginning of 20, 2021, there was no conversation, it wasn't going anywhere yeah. um, because they needed that compliance. We needed a cloud-based, they wanted a cloud-based backup with that. And um, unless we were gonna go through that in our own data centers, um, you know, that conversation was a dead stop. Um, so it was nice, you know, we've gone and now are revisiting them but now with knowing the capabilities that we're gonna be able to bring to the table. That's good. Well, that's six million businesses in the United States that actually have HIPAA requirements, yep. of which I'm guessing four million don't know it, <laughs> but uh, they do. What about, what about you, Brian, uh, in terms of uh, the hottest regulations that you're hearing about? Well, I think for us, it's 80% is definitely CMC. Uh, we're still seeing companies that are saying, even though there's not, you know, there's only five, you know, uh, assessors out there, they know as they ramp up, they're going to quickly get those assessors on. They want to get out there. They want to be in that first group. They want to get certified as quickly as possible. Um, they know that if they're not in that first wave, it's going to come a flood. And so many of the companies we're talking to are wanting to be on that first, you know, cusp and get certified as quickly as possible, get ready, and then get certified as quickly as possible. After the 80%, we're, we're not seeing HIPAA at all. Uh, the reason being is because there's really no teeth in it. You, you mentioned that there's, you know, there's some hefty fines for it, but there's nothing, there's nothing out there forcing people to do it. Now PCI, whole different story. You, you don't get certified in PCI, you have a problem, you just can't take credit cards anymore. Well, that stopped that, didn't it, you know? Yeah. So PCI has got some teeth in it, HIPAA. Um, we refer to it as grandma with, with uh, no dentures in. Um, <laughs> you know, she, she might gum you to death, but that's gonna be a while. Um, after that, socks. Uh, SOC 2 Type 2 reports, tremendous focus on that. And then after that, it's really um, a matter of companies that are in their contracts that says you have to be NIST 171 compliant or you have to be NIST 853 compliant. So we're seeing a lot of those in too. But okay. overwhelmingly, it's CMMC. It's, it's got the, yeah. I'll stop your business from operating tomorrow if you don't make it work. <laughs> And, and we get that question too. He talked about SOC 2 type 2 and we, we were surprised and I'm seeing more and more of that too where when we start working with as an MSP, um, they're coming to us and saying what are your certifications, right? Mm -hmm. as, as a delivery partner to them and they want to see that process. They want to see those documents as, as part of a checkbox for them and their security teams as you go to deliver that. So that's one for us where we're audited annually and everything else so we can be able to differentiate some of what we're doing against other MSPs that may not be having that, that certification. So that conversation does come up as, an, as a reseller um, that not only is Acronis have SOC 2 Type 2 and these processes in place, but M Mr. MSP, what are your certifications as well? So that comes up quite a bit um, in our conversations. Okay. That's got to make you feel good yep. when they ask that question. It does. That means they it, care, right? They care, right? And, and it usually becomes a differentiator for yeah, us, too, exactly. because a lot of, especially small to mid-sized MSPs, just aren't going through that process on yep. it. Um, so to be able to deliver that document, um, have them review our processes in place, um, I, I think that, that, you know, I think you're going to see some MSPs now start looking at that as part of their value add to bring that service to the table, too. Well, the joke is, is that for most MSPs, when they're asked about socks, they go, sure, I wear socks. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like they, they have no idea what a SOC 2 Type 2 is. Yeah, I mean, right. ask them, give me a 30 second definition of what a SOC 2 Type 2 is. We're waiting, you know, no idea. Even though it's a foundation for most certifications. They, they don't know. They, they, yeah. they right. know NIST, they know cybersecurity framework, they know a lot of the other, but SOC 2 Type 2, no. no, most of them have no idea, no clue. So, so I have to ask you, Brian, do you think grandma will get some teeth over time? <laughs> Um, well, she may, but I kind of highly doubt that it will happen in the next um, six or eight years. Uh, we're continuing to see, and just if you haven't lost the frame of, of reference here, uh, HIPAA becoming some teeth in it to where you know people will have to be compliant. There's a high trust certification. That's HIPAA with teeth. You know, kind of a little, you know, maybe some fangs in front, some molars on the back and the, you know, on the bottom, but. It's not. It's not there. Because because medical records is great. It is. The, yeah, it's the data, number right? one most attacked record there is. I mean, you know, my driver's license, I can lose it and I can get another one tomorrow. You know, my credit card, I lose it and a half an hour from now I can you know I can have a new number. 
but your medical records are with you for the rest of your life, just like your social security number. You can't change it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the crooks are going after our medical records and that's the number one thing. But yet we as a country, even though we still hear this in the news day and day, you know, about somebody's, you know, records being tossed in the, t you know, in the trash. We hear it all the time, but nobody really cares because it doesn't make an impact on business. It's only a nuisance, and to us it's a nuisance. Where they care is when it's gonna make a difference to national defense, or critical infrastructure, or they're gonna taint my water supply, or my electricity is gonna go off. Now we care. Yeah, but I mean, think about it. So you had a, a tantrum when you were 20 years old and somehow it got record and you had to maybe seek a little therapy. That's gone, you were just an idiot. I've done stupid things in the 20s. Thank <laughs> God there was no social media. Uh, and now somebody won't hire you because they have a copy of your medical record and they see that you have anger management issues. Right. John, um, tell us more. <laughs> Should I scoot over? Issues, or what? <laughs> After a few drinks. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, the a Corvette was involved. I'll just tell you that. Was <laughs> and uh, but or or it could be something even more serious, like a, uh, a medical condition where you are treated for the rest of your life, and now the employer is thinking, well, that's going to raise my insurance rates. They'll never yes. talk about it publicly because it's illegal. But now you're not being hired, right? right? Because they happen to know that you you'll just be more costly to the company. It's yeah. it's really cancer. Right. If you've yeah. had cancer as a youth. That company's going to look at you and go, whoa, you know, I'm looking at that person to be in with my company for the rest of their life. Yeah. You know, that's a burden on my company. That could be an immediate thought of, I don't know if I want to bring that guy in and or people, a woman. You know? Yeah, and, and people, people just don't. Yeah. Uh, they, don't, they don't connect the two. No. 28,000 a day is the number of medical records that are stolen. 28,000? A day. I, I believe it. Yes, back there. Good question for Brian. Wait, wait, a, uh, for, wait for the mic, sir. Thank you. My name is Harry as well. Hello, this Harry. This question is for Brian. Since they're weeding everybody out with the CMMC process, why is the VA still st giving these certifications to, for the service disabled veteran owned business and veteran owned business? They're just going to weed them out. Well, see, here's the deal. They're weeding down the number to get rid of the companies that they don't really want to have to worry about. These are the small mom and pop shops. Now, the companies you're talking about, they got to force them to get certified. And that's the way they're doing it. Okay. It's the mom and pop shops, the two, three person. Like I said, this one customer we had, $28 million a year that they're doing, they're building one specific part for the Humvee. Very highly machined part. I got to be careful how I say this. Uh, very technically adept. You got to, you can't just be a Joe in a machine shop and build it, right? So they're doing 28 million a year. Well, this is the one of the ways that those DOD companies could weed down that number from 300,000 of companies that have never bothered to do security. They just say, you know what? You haven't done security. You're not going to do it. You're off my list. That's how they're getting this number down. But then they need to add that to the certification process because, like you said, a lot of them don't know. Exactly. Exactly. But here's the point. You've got two different families, let's say. One, I'm going to weed you out. You know, I'm going to get the – it's like, you know, death on the Kalahari, you know. You know, the, the, uh, the lions go after the weak and the sick water buffalo. You know, they don't go after the great big one leading the pack. Let's get the old ones, the weeded ones out of there. Well, then the second group, that's what they really care. And those are the ones they want to force to be certified within the next year. Good question, though. That's important distinction to remember. You're in one of those two groups. Are you weak and sick? You know, as a company, you got two or three people. You don't have a security person. Okay. You don't have an MSSP that knows what, how to spell socks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then you gotta worry about where you're at. And, and I think, uh, Harry, to your point, it's also about the partnerships, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. So that you don't have to do it all uh, yourself. Uh, v CISO is an example where you might not be able to afford a CISO. Right. That's why can, I'm in business. You can get one yeah. enough yeah. or you partner with a company that has that expertise. Uh, by the way, thank you for your service. Uh, yes, again. thank you. Thank you. And, thank you. Uh, uh, but that's super, super important. So um, going back to uh, compliance, but this time in the context of cloud, how has that changed the compliance world? And uh, why don't we start with Keith? Yeah, I, I think it was easier back in the day when you had everything under your own umbrella, right? Like you can, con your controls were in place for you. So once that data moves offsite, it becomes a completely different animal. I think, you know, look at the products that you have for that, the hardened systems and everything to remain self-contained. 
Um, you know, it, we were, um, we even went through, um, we've had a couple different opportunities where we've lost out because the way the data was being written in the cloud didn't comply with what they needed um, because they were, had different requirements. So um, not only do you have to worry about that infrastructure on your site, but now that it's moved off site, what do those entities look like, right? And so um, there's certain spaces that we just stay out of from a, a, a support perspective, just because the check marks are so significant. We don't do a lot of federal work just because of the requirements. We've had some subcontractors around the DOD space that we've been able to have conversations with, but not fulfill all the requirements. So I think there's, there, you're seeing a lot of specialization specific to those requirements, and those are being supported by a very narrow scope of industries and, and, and providers that can actually deliver that service. Um, so um, I think it's a, it, it can be a hard animal to corral when you have all these different requirements. Um, so I think that really is where um, we see companies that are going very specific around and, and, and attacking those verticals because they will be successful because of that. Um, I mean, even like, so that's why we're here today talking about SES, I mean, and, and, and really talking about that technology because now you have a cloud-based service that checks the boxes that um, we have found providers that haven't been able to do, you know, and, and provide that service. So I think that's the, that's the, the, the key piece for there is when, when you start talking about cloud is that you have to have entities that understand what is coming and, you know, have to be involved to protect and, and deliver that service and that data um, in a way that makes sense for the end customer that's going to be con consuming it. Yeah. So you need people like Brian and Chris to be able to do those services for you because most people don't understand what's really involved when that happens because it's easy. Going to the cloud is supposed to be easy and cheap, right? right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you flip a switch, you move it out, you're using someone else's compute and storage, you, you know, but um, especially for these customers that don't understand the impact and, and what has to happen with that system when it's out there, um, it, that, that's really where it becomes difficult. Well, and where it, it actually gets more difficult is some of the bigger service providers, whose name I won't mention uh, here, they don't like talking about not having these cl yep. the clients because it gives the perception that their service is not mm -hmm. complete or inferior, yep. mm -hmm. and it's just against their marketing sure. philosophy. Uh, so, for example, you know, don't back up Office 365. You don't need to because it's on Azure. But the truth is, you should because right. even it goes down right. sometimes, right? And That's true. Uh, oh, and lots of other it's reasons. only 90 days. I mean, we can go through the whole list of right. why, what they're but not doing. They'll never talk about that, and right. they'll never publicly endorse a vendor who's protecting that service. Mm -hmm. right. So it becomes uh, complex. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about cloud and compliance? So we have the benefit as an MSP that we are largely um, all in on Microsoft 365. And from the compliance perspective, you know, our, our contractor clients are all in GCC high. Mm. Um, if you're unfamiliar with, with GCC and GCC High and, and Azure government, it's just Microsoft's government cloud, right? Uh, sovereign, US citizens, US data centers, et cetera, et cetera. The running joke has been that GCC High and the features in there are akin to what Office 365 was about two or three years ago. And that's still true to this day. I will say that they're getting better. Um, and you know, being able to, Microsoft's got a great security and compliance center. Um, there's, they've got great mappings of flow downs that you can use. And there's a lot more integration nowadays, like a Cronus SCS will eventually be able to back up our GCC high stuff. Mm -hmm. right. That's dope. We've been, needed, we've been needing that forever. Yeah. Um, and you know, retention rules, they just don't do the same thing as an actual backup, right? Um, GCC high also has like the, image state backup, which okay. is required for certain compliance things. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the benefits. And, and Keith, just like you said, that's why we don't have all our eggs in a bunch of different baskets. Because, I mean, trying to vet 15 different companies to try and do something, yep. when Microsoft appears to be trying to take over the world anyway, um, we just need to go in with that and then find solutions that augment our stack and work for what we're doing for our clients to mitigate their risk while doing the compliance stuff, then everything's hunky-dory. Yeah. It's that easy. Any thoughts? <laughs> oh, I've got thoughts running all over my head. <laughs> on, on compliance and cloud, sorry. <laughs> well, so I've got a little bit of a different approach because I worked with two of the largest cloud providers that there were. 
So my customers were like the US, you know, NSA before NSA had their own, you know, stuff. Um, there's a there's a great quote out there. It says, "Unless you learn from history, you're going to repeat it again." Nice thing about being old is you start remembering about how things are changing in history. And gosh sakes, for all of us that are you know gray haired and are losing our hair, you know, um, we remember back when there was a mainframe. Everything was contained in the mainframe. Everything was secure. A friend of mine in Phoenix, um, he actually is the guy who set up the original NASA control center. Now, if you watch the movie and you're doing those little clips in Apollo uh, 10 and Apollo 13 or whatever, we'll find him in the movie every once in a while. This guy set up the security for the entire center. NASA was never hacked back then, ever. When did they start getting hacked? When they connected them to the internet, when they lost control, okay? So we're starting to see that pendulum, and the, the pendulum doesn't go this way, if you know. A pendulum can go any one of a lot of different directions. So what we're seeing is we're seeing now companies are pulling this stuff back and they're saying, you know what, if you're going to deal with my data, you're going to deal with it somewhere to where I got control again, in the mm -hmm. cloud, in a place where I can control it. So we're seeing now agencies that are pulling that information back and they're putting it on a cloud and they're saying, if you're going to deal with my data, you're going to deal with my data where I can secure it. Now, I can't secure it necessarily on your site, but that's why I'm going to put these controls in place. So we're seeing a, a lot of that shift now going back again to where we're getting rid of the data centers, we're getting rid of the, the server that was sitting in the closet because of course, it's a lot easier for me to spin up a, a server or two on, on Amazon than it is for me to worry about that you know, server that's sitting in the uh, next to the room, next to the kitchen that has an AC connection off of it. <laughs> and once in a while when they plug the vacuum cleaner in out there, I, you know, I lose some transactions. You know, those things are gone. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of this coming in the next two to three years, really, to where we're seeing a lot more contracts going to require you to work with the data the way they want you to work with the data. I'll tell you a little story. In the 90s, mid-90s, I was one of the first guys to test Internet Explorer before it existed. And so I needed a computer that had access and, uh, to the Internet. And those of us who had that, we actually had to sign a piece of paper yeah, that said I remember that, that if if you got compromised, mm -hmm. Bill Gates personally would come and fire you. It literally said, <laughs> Bill Gates will come and well, fire you. And if I remember right, it also said that if you, if you get compromised, you will no longer ever get uh, access again. Yes. So yeah, that was absolutely. the stamp of, oh my God, you know. So yeah. there were maybe, I don't know, 30 of us, something like that back then that had access. Yeah. And you were really scared because, you know, like you said, Bill Gates coming after you. I was more about the guys with the badges and the, you know, the black suits coming after me. Yeah. Or the white suits. The white suits, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, those, those were um, interesting times. Uh, one last question, then we'll see if the audience uh, has some questions as well. How are you thinking about CMMC for your own organization? I know we're, lo we're looking to be level three compliant. Uh, we've already done an internal audit. We know we have a few controls we're missing, but we won't uh, implement those. We'll implement those over the next few months, and then we'll wait when auditors are more readily available since it's not exactly required. Uh, but why don't we start with you and work our way down? So uh, we work through our NIST 800-171 compliance on a fairly regular cadence. We, we have meetings, we talk about things, we review policies, procedures, et cetera. We, we make changes as necessary. Um, and so your, your 171 is 110 controls, CMMC level three is 130, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that, that little 20 delta. And when the time comes, if it comes in my lifetime, then we'll deal with it. I'm not really so <laughs> sure that it will, to be completely honest with you, um, but in my mind, the, the 800-171 is a great place to start. If you, if you can just do those 110 things, that's significantly a, a better cybersecurity posture than not doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you all want to take this back to your, to your organizations and just look at stuff, 171A is the assessor's guide. And it'll go through every single control all, all 14 families, every single control, line by line, it'll tell you what to look for, what paperwork to look for, you know, just all the way down the line. Um, it's a great place to start. 
if you're even looking at anything related to CMMC. So that's where we are. For us, like I talked about, we focus um, exclusively on backup and DR right now. And really the Acronis services is allowing us to make this transition into the security component that's coming with it. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, like we went through SOC 2 Type 2 to be able to have our processes audited and talk about how we deliver services to these end customers. So I think for us, it's now, as we move into the security space, this is one of the other levels that we have to start evaluating. Um, plus I'm on the sales side, so I'll let my operations guys deal with that. <laughs> um, but that's really where it, it comes to for us, is I think as we evaluate how we're moving into this market, um, we're going to have to look at a whole different set of services. I mean, this is part of the conversation we're seeing, and, and that's gonna come back to us. If we're doing this, if you're going to be delivering to these different verticals that we're talking about here, um, those are all standards that we have to really um, start to evaluate and what we need to be able to effectively deliver that as not only an MSP around backup and DR, but are we gonna step into MSSP and, and be, add the security services um, in conjunction with that. Okay. Well, let me step back a second because I'm sure that most of you are not as intimately familiar with CMMC as we are. You've got to first do a risk assessment, and the risk assessment is you go through with a certified company that can be able to take you through those controls, 110 of them if you're looking at level three. So the, the company, the partner, the vendor you work with is going to tell you, I want you to be level three, or I want you to be level four. God forbid if they say a level five, you know, that's like <laughs> walks on water, and you know, uh, that, that's, that's really stringent. Uh, but most companies are being told you got to be level three by this, this date, okay? So you've got a risk assessor that's certified, get you to the point to where you're compliant. Now you've got an assessor, we've got now five of them, they're gonna assess you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'll clap. Um, there's assessor that's gonna be out there, they're gonna certify you by going down every one of those, those controls, how are you doing this, give me the proof, how are you doing this, give me the proof, okay, all that down through, and they're gonna stamp and they're gonna say you're certified, now I'm CMMC compliant. Okay, we, the company I work for, uh, Cozyant, is one of the few C3PAO companies. That means we are certified to do the risk assessment. There's not a lot of us out there. So not only do they, own, do they have this bottleneck in the companies that can actually do the certification, they've got a bottleneck in the companies that can actually do the risk assessment first. Mm. So that's why we're so busy right now is, and, and the, um, the CEO of our company, Brian Blakely, another Brian, I guess we just run the packs. Um, <laughs> I've known him for 10 years. He had this idea of virtual CISO and that's why I joined the company. I love the idea of being able to spread my you know, wealth of knowledge you know, throughout a lot of companies. So he is going to also be, then be one of the few certified companies that can then be able to do this, this level of, of information gathering and everything else and get trained just like the assessors would. So we'll get that same knowledge that the assessor would, and then we bring it into the assessment first. But like I said, the first problem is, and this is what people seem to forget, is you got a bottleneck at the beginning of the interstate, then you got the bottleneck of the traffic on the interstate, and then the, the exit is so far down the line, you know, some people aren't even worrying about it. You're so, talking about the road, I don't even know where we're yeah, going. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> I don't even know what the destination is. But that's where my concern is, is right now is, we're just trying to deal with the here and now, which is we've got so many companies that are saying, you know, I'm out of business next week if I don't get some kind of a, a compliance. So we're working in the now, worried about the next 12 to 18 months. Thanks. Brian, can I ask a question? Yep. Sure. Uh, uh, to, in order to get to uh, that level, at level three, and you go through this process, first the risk assessment, then the security assessment, if you're lucky or unlucky enough, yeah. That is a great question. And you know what? <laughs> the, the board, the AB, CMMC-AB, the advisory board that was set up by the DOD, they were physically set up by the Department of Defense in order to create this whole structure. They said, basically, we got this problem, guys. We need to bring a whole bunch of smart guys in from these universities and whatever, and they're going to create this board, and they're going to run this as a certification program. It became CMMC-AB. So if you want to learn a little bit more about the history, go there, cmmc ab ab.org, great information facility. What they're telling us on there is, we don't know. 
That's the end answer is we don't know how the assessors are going to work. We don't know if they're going to be up front. They're going to be a lot more money because there's going to be a few of them. We don't know if it's going to be 60,000, 30,000 or, you know, give me a check for a hundred bucks and we're, we're good, call it good. You know, there's no, there's no idea. So what we're trying to do is get people as close as we can to the end zone and then say, once the numbers do come out, now you've got some options. But if you wait until sometime, let's say, second quarter of 2022, and you say, now I want to start the journey. Well, the journey is a 12-month journey. It's like going to Mars. Mars is only five months away, folks. It's going to take us 12 months to get to CMMC. You know? So the point is, is if you're not thinking about starting that journey very quickly, you're going to be too late. You know? it's, you, it's a 12-month job. We see a lot of companies say, I'm gonna compress it to six months, and I go, oh my God, you have no idea what you're getting into. But that's business sometimes. The one thing I'd, I'd add is there are a lot of fraudulent companies already popping up, offering auditing services yeah. uh, to, make, to give you the certificate, which don't exist. There's yeah, only five, true. Yeah. right? Uh, so you do need to make sure. Yeah, And you can go on cmmc-ab.org and they will tell you the companies as they pop up, they'll tell you. That's how I'm on that list. So that's why I know this this morning, number five jumped on there. There's a question right there. No, just five minutes. Ah, okay, sorry, the light is... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that wasn't just high. <laughs> there is a question over there. His good looks was just glaring. <laughs> so, yeah, Mark Kirstein also with Coast and Cybersecurity. But a question for, for Chris. Uh, do you have clients that are not security oriented? In other words, no, kind of typical MSP clients? And if so, what has been your experience as a client gets onto the compliance journey? what happens to the revenue of the MSP for security operations because now they have to do 110 controls and maintain them? Good question. Um, so we, we try to price things reasonably. Um, as Brian said, this is not an easy process, right? And, and we are still, I don't care about CMMC. It'll come one day when Jesus does, it doesn't matter. NIST 800-171, you have to abide by. To, to play ball with the government right now the second, right? So that's where our focus is. And our assessments and implementations, I mean, uh, the whole reason CMMC even exists is because NIST 800-171 failed. Like nobody talks about that, but that's why, right? Because that was a standard that you could self-attest to and you had those 300,000 companies who either totally ignored it or self-attested and just lied their ass off and this is where we're at. Mm -hmm. You know I'm right. Yeah. Um, Granny. Yeah. Granny was back again. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I can tell you from our experience, we, we do make money from the NIST projects for sure, um, but it is not nearly as much as I have seen some of our competitors in the Northern Virginia DC metro area make, which I think is a little absurd to be honest. And Brian, to go back to your pricing thing, like there's only five of you guys. Can't mm -hmm. you just kind of world's your oyster? I want five million dollars well, for an that's assessment the whole thing. right now. The the, uh, the board is says that when it comes, they're going to arrange and set pricing. So we may not have a choice. Right now, we can set our pricing based on what the market is, and we're kind of basing it on a regular risk assessment. Right. But in three months, six months from now, we don't know what the market's going to do. No, totally makes sense. Um, to finish off the answer to your question, thank you for the question, by the way. Um, they don't let me play with the finances of the company so much. I just do the technical stuff and all the paperwork because <laughs> nobody wants to do it. Um, but I do know we make money and I get a paycheck. <laughs> and I would imagine that it is, it is a decent amount of money. Um, I believe we probably could charge a little bit more for it. And we may have to, really. Uh, I think it really just depends on, on where the, the board and, and mm -hmm. groups like Brian's folks, they, where they land on everything. But there's, it's a tremendous opportunity, even just in the, the 800-171 space. Tremendous opportunity. Giant pain in the ass. Tremendous opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> any, any closing questions? We have 
about a minute left. And yes. you haven't talked about finding resources and experts to actually do all this work. Yeah. I mean, that's, we haven't even touched it. 600,000 open positions no. right. in cyber. Yes, yeah. go ahead. So in a previous career, I was uh, doing environmental compliance. Um, one of the things, uh, would, forgive me a little bit here, but best available control technology versus best economic control technology ended up being kind of a mechanism of regulatory capture. And so in the end, we were seeing the policy making process coming out with r restrictions, policies, new programs that were driven primarily by General Electric's desire to sell selective catalytic mm -hmm. reduction, for example. So to what extent do you see the, the cybersecurity policy frameworks as true pragmatic praxis oriented things versus government things that are ultimately just making us money, but also, you know, not practically advantageous for our country. It's a well, fascinating I'll question. I'd love yeah. to, love to. That's a <clears throat> great question. I gotta tell you, I have never heard that question asked in any forum in the last two years. And it's such an obvious question. The answer is zero. It is agnostic because the controls, those 110 controls, just like uh, Chris had said earlier, if you just follow those 110 controls, you are going to be very secure. No doubt about it. These are standards that come from NIST, National Institute for Security, uh, Security Standards uh, Technology. And basically what these are, a lot of smart guys got together and said, if we had to narrow it down to as few questions as we possibly could, you know, are you, do you have anti-malware on your workstations, you know? Do you use a VPN to connect through remotely, okay? These are all really, really basic things. That's what the 110 questions are, the controls. But people get confused about the fact is they don't specify a product. None of them no. specify a product. It's completely agnostic. So the only thing that they want you to do is follow it. They don't care how you follow it. You can even follow it in a way that is completely untraditional. And I can explain that, but it'd take 10 minutes. But the point is, is they just want you to be secure. They don't care how you do it, whose product you buy. Good question. Keith, did you have something you no, wanted I'm to say? Good. So anyways, we're out of time. So 30 seconds or less, closing thoughts. Uh, we'll start with you and then work our way back. Brian. Wow. Um, okay, so I would say that um, the, my closing thoughts are if you're involved in CMMC, the best thing to do right now is get in that in that circle quickly and get going. Understand more about it. If you're a company that is dealing with a DOD vendor, you better learn about it quickly because those letters are coming out every month. And if you're a DOD supplier, I don't care if you're the, uh, the sick and the wounded over here or if you think you're at the head of the pack, if you get that letter and you can't attest to those 10 or 12 things on there, you will stop getting business from that company. So if all of your business is coming from the DOD, you better think about it quickly. I think for me, uh, one of the things we're excited about, it, we talked about it, is being able to proactively go after this vertical with solutions and, and technologies that are gonna check all these boxes for them. Yeah. Um, so for us, we can now very vertically aligned, proactively educate a customer and deliver a set of services that we haven't seen before, um, quite packaged the way that we see it from, from SES. Um, so for us, this is a very interesting time for us to really um, kind of go after a specific vertical in a way that is typically underserved um, and we talked about it and, and, and understaffed and has no budget. Yeah. Um, so you've got an interesting mix of, of a cost effective service um, aligned with an organization that is hungry for an MSP type delivery. Um, so I think um, the combination is really attractive um, and that's one of the things we're, we're really looking forward to with the service set that we have with SCS. Thanks. Chris? Two things. Um, Certifications and compliance in general are not one and done things anymore. Mm -hmm. They require effort, they require time, money largely required also, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a continuous process. And two, uh, just like Brian said, if, if you have people that are in this vertical, if you have companies that you, you work for that are in this vertical, that this is, you know, you, if you're not on this train already, go find a copy of 171A, start looking at stuff. It's not an impossible task, uh, it's difficult. There, there are people like me, there, there's people, I forgot the mic was there. 
but there are people who can help, right? And we're all over the place. There may be a, a shortage of cybersecurity professionals, yes. Um, but we're still out here. Yeah. And this is the kind of stuff that keeps us up at night, worrying about how we're going to solve these types of problems for the 300,000 clueless federal contractors out there. That's not even to mention the state and the local right. governments who are still running Windows XP, 311, <laughs> yeah. NT4, whatever. Um, that's an entirely separate thing. But yeah. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. A bit of a